So this is Mike Lane, and please tell us how you got involved and, and what's going on. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for having me. Um, as he said, my name is Mike Lane. I'm from Fort Myers, Florida. Don't hold that against me. Yeah, don't hold that against me. Uh, so I, I studied bonsai under Eric Weiger. I got interested in bonsai in 2008. I was basically given a juniper like a lot of us, and I took this juniper home, was fascinated by it, and I quickly killed it. And uh, so I started really started researching and looking up real bonsai nurseries. I knew what I had wasn't quite the real thing, and I found Eric Weiger. Kind of begged him to apprentice with him for many months, and then uh, apprenticed with him for uh, the last, you know, 16 years or so, as well as many other uh, masters such as Seth Nelson, uh, Juan Andre, Mark Noleander, uh, to name a few. So I do specialize in shogun, but I also specialize in uh, tropicals and clip and grow design. So uh, bougainvillea is right up my alley. This is something we work on extensively in Florida. It's a really, really good tropical material. It does have some uh, some drawbacks, though, that we'll talk about while we're working through it. Um, but bougainvillea is a staple in Florida bonsai. I would say, if you think about Japanese bonsai and how there's the black pine, Japanese maple, azalea, things like that, this is in that, that hierarchy of tropicals that we use. So this is one of the staples. So wherever you go in the world, in tropical bonsai, they're going to be using bougainvillea. Even in Japan, they use bougainvillea. I just posted on my Facebook last month uh, a Kokofuten album with a bougainvillea on the cover. So that there's been a bogey in Kokofuten. Um, there's a lot of different genetics with bogies. We call them bogies, bougainvillea. And um, I don't know a whole lot about the specific species and whatnot. What I do know is there are three primary ones that we work with in the nursery. We work with what we call the purple, which has the diamond-shaped leaves and the little kind of purple flower. We work with what we call the red or magenta, and that has the heart-shaped flower, and we also work with the pixie bougainvillea a lot. Um, they're all different, and I would say this is my favorite variety. The purple variety grows the most vigorous, ramifies the best, gives you the best bonsai design. It also flowers in the design, so the reds or the magentas um, tend to flower far outside of where you, you prune the design. You have to kind of let them grow out and billow out. And, um, and they don't ramify very well. They're not very good for bonsai. So this is the preferred. I, I believe this is Bougainvillea glabra. Uh, there's also Bougainvillea spectrobilis and countless others. But those three are the ones that we primarily use. So the thing about Bougainvillea and what we're, we're going to have to try to avoid um, or we will try to avoid is making a big trunk chop. My, my biggest critique of bougainvillea as a material is that if it has a trunk chop on it, it has a kind of inevitable future ahead of it. Um, that's usually going to end up a hollow trunk. So usually that, that wound, that big wound will end up hollowing out and I'd say probably seven or eight out of ten times uh, that tree will slowly start withering away. So I'll go to people's houses who have had bogies for ten years in the first couple years, everything's great. The fifth year or so, we lose a major part of the trunk. You know, something rots out and it kills off a major portion of the trunk. So we lose that. Then maybe another five years down the road, we lose another piece of the trunk. And before you know it, this like once big massive bougainvillea is just like a, a bunch of slivers and pots. And so uh, the bogies that I tend to really like to grow now is from cutting. And I like to try to heal the wounds as best I can. Um, the way we do that, we were talking about, those of you who have kind of come to some of the other programs I've been talking about, is it's a lot of the clip and grow theory. So we use bifurcation and we make sure that every wound that we're placing on the tree is placed in between two branches. So a bogey is not a good healer. It's a really, really poor healer. And the only way you're going to cover a wound up 100% is if you regrow the exact same amount of material that you cut off. So think, if you do that and you cut it again, you're just gonna have the same size wound. So how we trick that is we put the wound in the middle and we heal half the wound with one branch and half the wound with the other branch. And so now we don't have to grow those branches to the same size as what we cut off. We have to grow them to half the size of what we cut off. And so then when we cut those, we'll get quarter the size of what we cut off. 
And so eventually you're working the wound into the ether. Gone. I thought I turned it off. Um, so that's one of the ideas with building from cuttings with bogies is I basically build them branch by branch and ideally I like to build them slowly and heal the wounds best I can. Um, I don't mess with a lot of landscape ones anymore uh, because of the wounds and the issues I've had with them. Now you can use uh, wood hardener, uh, minwax, or what was the other one you, you guys really PC like? Petrifier. PC Petrifier is really good to kind of hold the wood, um, but it will eventually you know, give up on you. It will eventually, you'll lose the battle. So one of the first things I'm gonna do is kind of look at the material and start assessing where we lose interest in the trunk. So one of the best things Eric ever taught me, the best little tidbit, I think, that I still use today. <laughs> That's not a Tommy. That's not a Tommy song. That's good. So one of the, the most important thing that I found is you cut where the, the tree lacks uh, movement or taper. So if you're following a branch and it doesn't have movement in it, all of a sudden it quits moving and it quits tapering and it just goes straight, you cut at the, the section that it starts going straight. So think about this, you, in no art form is it acceptable to stare at a straight, unchanging line, a line that does nothing. It's boring, there's no interest to it no dynamic flow, there's no changing of states, it does nothing. And so we have no interest in straight lines and our job when we find straight lines on the tree is to eliminate them uh, and to regrow interest in the trunk via taper or movement. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make an assessment on where there's straight trees in the tree and I'm just going to cut. And on tropicals like Bougainvilleas, we can cut indiscriminately. You don't have to worry about, oh, is there a bud there, is there not a bud there? There will be a bud there. So um, that's gonna be the first thing I do. And so let's go ahead and start playing with this exercise. And I'll pick one of these trunks and I'll actually step in front so that you guys can hopefully see what I'm doing. You guys still see over here a little bit? Or is it better if I'm here? All right, I'll just lean over the table. So you can go work and then shut it off. All right, yeah, yeah. So here's an area right here on this first trunk where you see we come up the trunk and we come out on the first branch and this first branch from here to here has no taper, right? No taper, no movement. So right around here where there's this branch is where I'm gonna cut it. And I, at this stage, I act like a, a machine. I don't put any feelings into this, this process. I don't like look at the tree and say, oh no, I'm cutting off a bunch of stuff. I do this first pass as though I have no attachment to the tree. And you almost have to. You have to just be a machine to the, the math, okay? So we're just looking at these, these diminishing taper ratios. So now I work my way up this trunk and you see we have nice movement, movement, movement. This branch is super straight back here. We'll cut that back. Come up to here, clean that stub. That, that's our wrapper for you tonight. Okay, awesome. I'll try to leave some of it. No, I'll leave some. I'm just getting around. I'll try to leave some of it. Okay, so here's another one, long and straight, no taper. So we cut again. So you see where I cut, it's not that I want to be mean and just shorten the tree or anything like that. I'm looking at areas where it hasn't done anything and I'm encouraging it to change. We're gonna do something. We're gonna put interest in the area with no interest. And then we're gonna defoliate so everybody can see clearly. Now defoliating is not a technique I I recommend for building branches, a, a common misconception with tropical trees is you just defoliate, 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 and you get a lot of branches. And that's not true. Um, defoliating always weakens the tree. It's always stressful on the tree. And it never um, benefits us really if we do it completely. It's always for our benefit. So I'm defoliating right now, not for the tree's benefit, but so that we can see in and I can put wire on very easily. 
and the tree is strong enough that it will handle it. But if I wanted to build branches, if I wanted to go, so the typical branch pattern is one to two, two to four, four to eight, and so on. If I wanted to do that, and I get to a point where this branch is just starting to push out here, this is nice and strong, and this is barely pushing out, and I want that one, two to four pattern, well now this, if I defoliate this and this evenly, this is gonna die because it just got weaker and these are gonna be fine. So now I won't go one to two to four, I'll go one to two to three. And so we're not doubling the branches. And so in ramification, the term ramification, we want to be building an exponential division of branches. So we wanna be doubling them every time we prune with bifurcation, one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, and so on and so forth. And so we, we build in a lot of different ways. You don't have to build these flat little pads like I'm showing you guys. You can alter them in different heights and different elevations, but ultimately from the top, it's gonna be the same pattern. Okay? So like, do you show more time if you have black wire or a black background? Oh, sorry. So it's fine, and, and your angles are hard to see. So. Sorry about that. So if you guys can see here, that's kind of the shape that we're looking for there. Is that nice wired out uh, padded shape but what I was saying is it doesn't have to always be so flat you know you can play with dimension on certain designs and kind of elevate things and group things together in weird ways the only uh, rule that you have to think about the only thing that you can't get away from and where I say there isn't a creative kind of um, it's not up to you is thinning down the two branches so if you leave more than two branches, you are hurting the potential longevity of the design. Uh, meaning that in the future, you could grow reverse taper. Thank you. You could grow reverse taper, and then you have to cut that whole branch or that whole section of trunk off that you just put however many years into. So proper cleaning out, thinning down to twos is something that I really believe in. Um, there are, I have seen really good trees with bar branches but they're more the exception than, than the rule. You know, it's a lot easier to get into problems growing with bar branches. So now I'm gonna continue on with the tree. Let's move on to this trunk, the big trunk. And now the first thing I'm gonna cut is this big guy out of my way. He's big, long, and straight. Doesn't do anything for us. And I'm also gonna cut these guys. Now, one of the ways that we found to work with bougainvillea that's really effective, that uh, my teacher was really well known for bougainvillea uh, in the late 2000s, kind of early 2010s. And one of the things he was very famous for was cutting off all the old growth and letting it bud back new green branches and wiring all those out to get these perfect bougainvillea forms. So he gets he doesn't have to deal with this hard growth honestly how am I gonna wire this and move this I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get one of those looping branches like that and so it's always best to cut back to where it lacks movement or taper and wait for it to bud out and then you start wiring from that point so when is the best time to hard prune like this um, any time from I'd say in Florida, March through November, wow. you know, yeah. What's so the temperature range? Temperature range is I, ideally wine, evening right? temperatures are consistently above 65 for two weeks. You so for us, never. No, <laughs> no, but you do want, you do want consistent, heat. ideally consistent evening lows around 65 at night. And that will be, um, pretty good now with that said I've done a lot of repotting on bogies and I've worked on them a lot um, out of season I've worked on them in February and the trick is I do it like basically when we're close to the grow season and that way if it gets cold again and we get a cold snap I bring it in for a few days and I'm not overwintering this tree for months on end so I will kind of work them sometimes in February and do some potting and stuff like that okay Mike what's the temperature of a cold snap um, I'd say anything in the 40s is is uh, is something that can damage tropicals. So you get 40 over there? Yeah, oh yeah, we get we get like one or two freezes a year, okay. and um, 
and it can mess with some trees because think a lot of our trees that we grow we also import trees from places further south than us uh, from equatorial regions regions that don't have a season at all so any real uh, huge change in temperature 30 degrees or anything like that can be big big impact on the tree <coughs> So the other thing I'm doing is I'm thinning out these areas. You see how this is like a cluster of eight million branches? Well, more like seven coming from one spot. I need to thin that out best I can to a V that's coming at 10 and two, 10 o'clock and two o'clock, okay? And so I'm gonna go through here and ideally target the middle, the middle thick branches that are uh, breaking up the taper. Yes, they definitely, there are certain styles they don't lend themselves to. They don't lend themselves to weeping. Uh, it's a, they can do it, and I've seen some nice ones, but they're big, high maintenance, high, high maintenance. You'll be constantly wiring them. Um, I don't think they lend themselves well to windswept. I, I really don't. You know, some people do it, and you'd be shocked. I don't think they lend themselves well to bunjin. Um, I think, for me, you're largely locked into kind of the in, informal, uh, styles, maybe a formal occasionally, and you can do multi trunks, stuff like that. But I don't get too avant garde with the Bougainvillea. Uh, with that said, some of my biggest inspirations come from Taiwan, and there's an artist there named Min Swan Lo, who is a big clip and grow artist, and he's made some really unique uh, Bougainvillea trees that you can't really quantify with a style. They don't, they're one of a kind trees that will never be made again. You know, so. I've seen some really cool stylings like that. Uh, what would be the ideal size of a clipping? Uh, oh. Like a quarter inch or half an inch? So for me, this is, this is an ideal cutting, like oh, that. Okay. Um, some people, you can root anything on a bogey. You can root a cutting this big with a bogey, but I don't necessarily recommend it unless it's, unless you can't really tell, you know. Um, you're going to have a big big cut underneath, so if I try to root a big cutting, you're going to have a big hollow spot on the underside that's just holding water with no roots, and so I tend to just like um, growing from cutting. You know, one of the things I've, I've been talking about a lot on my, my trip here is how cutting can oftentimes be a tortoise beats the hare sort of endeavor. So the thing about clip and grow or the thing about growing one to two to four to eight is it's compound interest. So your first kind of investment's gonna suck. It's not gonna be the most fun thing you do. You're gonna make a few chops and you're gonna walk away and that's all you're gonna do to the tree for six to eight months. But then your next few chops, there's more. You do more chops. And then the time you wait between the next chop is less. And then it continues to become less and you continue doing more and more work. And so it becomes like compound interest where if you can stick with it in the beginning, the tortoise will beat the hare, the guy who bought the bigger tree. And so if I go out and I buy the bigger tree or I try to root the bigger cutting, I'll usually have bigger problems. If I buy a big tree from a nursery, the first thing I do is, well, it doesn't look like a bonsai. If I cut here, 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 now it will look like a bonsai. But now you just made a bunch of wounds that you, in theory, should fix. And so with the cutting, if you never make those mistakes, you never have to fix them. And so that's another way that you pass people by. So people will start with, you know, oh, I got a big fat tree, I, I got a head start. No, not necessarily. You did not. You got a big tree that now is gonna have big problems. And so not all the time, not all the time, but things, especially with Bougainvillea, I found that you're not necessarily always saving time um, just by getting a big trunk, you know? Uh, there's kind of a, a place in the middle where you can meet. And that's one of the things that I'm really kind of passionate about is because I, I travel all around the country and especially around Florida. And Florida has a lot of old rotted out bogeys that um, I've kind of seen the same story happen over and over and over. And now there are exceptions. I've, I've seen some bogeys that are 50 years old, you know, and so on. 
but they're very, very rare. Usually the bogeys don't make it that, that far. We got a, when it was 50 years old when we bought the house, it's still going. Oh yeah, no, in the, in the landscape, I will see them old, for sure. In the landscape, that's fine, but in bonsai pots, they tend to, and they don't even die. I shouldn't oh, even say that yeah. they die. They tend to just disintegrate into multiple pieces that end up becoming separate trees, and they lose the impact of that big trunk. So I shouldn't say that they die, because they don't. Okay. Do they like a lot of water, or do they like to be dry? They like it dry. So they like it a lot drier than uh, you would think. And so bougainvillea are also one of the few plants that when I do a repot and when Eric does a repot, they go right out in full sun. So, and they don't go, when we collect them out of the yard, we don't put them in like a recovery pot for a year or anything like that. They go right in a bonsai pot. And so they really, really thrive um, in these like abusive conditions. They really, really do. They thrive in it. And so Eric has, has tried, Eric has done the, um, Let's keep them in the shade and monitor them for a few weeks. And the, the evidence just doesn't back up that that is any better. Things recover slower. We had more issues with the bogies. And avoiding nursery soil also helped us. Not potting them in nursery soil, uh, keeping them in bonsai soil upon collection from that point onward really helps a lot as well. So, Mike, you would cut that to about a third and put that in the pot? This guy? Yeah. No, no, no. The, the the base. Oh, cut it about. Like, how much would you? No, no. The base. The root ball. Oh, the root ball. oh. I would take off every bit of this. Uh, every. I wouldn't like leave any soil. I'd completely right, right. But how, how much would you? Just to go right into a pot. Oh, and as much as you need to cut off. Yeah, it's going to handle it. So think, the tropicals especially store a lot of energy in the trunk. So in these branches, that's why they root cutting so easily. They store a ton of energy in this trunk. So even if you cut all the roots off and it has no roots, it's not gonna be focusing on, on, root, uh, on anything but growing roots after that. So the first thing this thing's gonna do is put all that stored energy that it's saved up into growing new roots. Okay? Can we go into shotgun? No, no. The cuttings, you know, the worst thing I'll do if I wanna take cuttings is I'll kind of thin them out, maybe defoliate them a little bit and make sure they're not drawing up a ton of water. Um, but that's the only other thing. Same with these. If I'm gonna like really hard cut them, I might defoliate them or just uh, take off most of the leaves. Good question though. Now some of these trunks are pretty straight. Um, so we're gonna see what we can do with them, but the reality is that if I were at home, uh, we may, this may have been a quicker workshop. Or a quicker <laughs> We can go back and want to mention that. Show him. Uh, oh, the workshop <laughs> tomorrow? Yeah, he's having a workshop at Doyle's tomorrow. And uh, Brian just told me there's some open spaces. Sweet. So if anybody's interested, I can give you Doyle's number. Yeah, bring the bring the trough. Well, Torrance, yeah, Torrance. Okay, yeah, sure you'll send it out. Okay. Uh, I think it's $75. And how many hours are you doing? I don't, um, oh. not, I'm not sure. And it includes lunch, so you can't be Everything bad. with Doyle always includes food. So you just bring your own tree, right? Yes. Okay, so bring your own tree. Oh, bring your own tree. Are you doing a show meeting? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I, I, I was just told it's a workshop. Okay. Is, is you, it bring your own tree? Yes, Yeah, it is. bring your own tree. Do you know what Bob is going to do with the, bring it a, whatever? Um, it'll probably be from, um, Eight or nine till about three. Okay. Nine to three. Okay. Nine to three. Okay. And then Daichi's meeting is Friday night too. So right. He'll be doing uh, the meeting at Daichi. Do you have a graft different color? Yeah. And yeah, and we might we might do some grafting here today uh, once we get this cut back. Is something that I think I'm going to do. Do have a uh, this is going to make more sense to kind of graft onto and try and fix some things that way. So, because they root easily, they put out no, a lot of the tropicals graft pretty easy. It's um, 
just the nature, I, I might, I'm guessing, it's the nature of just the vigorous growth. They're very, very vigorous, most tropicals. And so they grow um, exceedingly fast. And so think of it like they look at a graft the same way that they look at a cracked branch. It's, it's not the most efficient branch, but if that's all they have, they'll use it. And so one of the ways that we graft is we cut the tree back really, really hard. And so think of it as we're giving the tree two, two choices. It can either sit and generate new buds and form new buds and put the energy into all that creation, or it can save energy and go into buds that we're gonna put in. And so because we've put it in that situation, it will usually take the grafts. Um, if I try to leave it full and try to graft in one or two branches, it won't usually work. So um, usually you have to kind of weaken the tree pretty good to get it to take grafts. How many types of tropicals do you work with other than like Brazilian rain trees, bougainvilleas, and ficuses uh, right. and the, you know, is there other different species? Oh yeah, I work with sea hibiscus, premna, uh, bluebell. How about buttonwood? Buttonwood is my favorite. Yeah, we have a lot of um, What else do we grow a lot of? Ficus. Um, oh, I mean, there's there's thousands, really. There's so many different varieties. Uh, I've grown probably, I don't know, I mean, I wanna think like 500 something different species maybe in the time of working at the nursery, at least. You know, so we've done a lot of, uh, a lot of different trees, a lot of different stuff in the time I've been doing this. And one thing that, that Bob and I were talking about too is, you know, at the nursery, there's been some things that Eric grew early on then he no longer grows. So there was like things, uh, I've seen just so much material kind of change over the years and seen a lot of different stuff. Not all of it tropical too. You know, I do work on junipers and pines and things like that. I just um, prefer to focus on what we're strong on. And I, I think that, you know, where I'm at, I'll always grow a better tropical than I will uh, a deciduous or pine. Would a bottle brush tree be considered? Yeah, and they do really well. You can you can do a bottle brush tree. <laughs> How do you make them bloom? That I don't know. <laughs> that I don't know. But there's dwarf bottle brush trees. There's all kinds of cool bottle brush that you can use. native species too, uh, gumbo limbo, like he said, buttonwood. Buttonwood is the tree that got me into bonsai. That was um, the first tree I saw that really made me kind of, what got me good. Uh, really made me kind of stop and, and it really made me make the decision to do this for a living. You know, it, it was, I was doing uh, stocks before this, I was a stock broker. And so I went out to see Eric's place and the second I kind of saw his, this buttonwood he had, this really big buttonwood, I was just taken aback and I couldn't believe that this tree, you know, a tree that I used to play in as a kid was now in this tiny little pot and growing with such a small amount of soil. And um, I was fascinated by it. So I made that decision right then and there, the first time I went out there that that was what I was gonna do. You know, I didn't know at that time. I, was I going to go back to college? Was I going to keep doing the stocks thing? I had no idea what I was going to do for my future. And then it all kind of just, I knew right away. It was like not even a question. So I'm just still just cutting through straight stuff. And then we'll start doing some grafting once I kind of get this thinned out. And now areas that do have movement and taper, I will leave those intact. I'm not gonna cut them off, like I said, just to be mean. And as I go, the little stuff that I leave behind, I'll go ahead and defoliate.
Are you leaving any leaves on at all? No, 100%. Nope. I want you guys to really see in here. And, and again, that's not a good thing to do to the plant. It's something you do if you can do it. And it's something you do if it's in your benefit and it'll help you out. But you always do it at the cost of some energy, you know? And so if my tree's weak or it's, it's not, uh, for any reason I'm suspicious that it might not enjoy, the, do well with the defoliating, then I don't do it. I'll do a partial defoliation, which a partial defoliation I think is much more effective for building branches. That's essentially where I would go through and look at every single branch on this tree. And you see there how there's branches of different sizes. This one's growing two inches. This one's growing about six inches. Are they going to, uh, are, are they as strong as one another is a good question. No. So if I defoliate both of these or I treat them the same way, are they gonna recover the same way? Yes. No? They won't because one is weaker and one is stronger. And so the strong one will recover just fine. The weak one will get weaker. And so that'll end up uh, costing us potentially the branch if we continue to aggravate it. So if we continue pruning. And so where this happens a lot is when we're indiscriminately pruning and we're pruning either with shape in mind or when we're defoliating too often and we're not paying attention to what we're taking leaves off of. And so you can end up taking off structure that we need to kind of build forward. So if you cut them both equally, they'd be okay, or does it matter where they're at on the... Matters where they're at energy-wise. So if this one is, like, let's say with this little guy. If this guy is barely coming out, so let's say we got this nice fork here, right? But this guy is just barely starting to come out. And I go prune, 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 prune. Well, now he's way weaker than him. He's nice and strong. He's all the way out here. This one's way, way weaker. So now I just made him weaker, weaker, a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker, a little bit weaker, but he's got the energy to deal with it. He doesn't. So now what'll happen is I lose this, and this is what I get. And you know it's a he. He or she. <laughs> California. <laughs> no. Uh, no, it's uh. You flustered me. You got me pretty good. <laughs> so with that scenario, would you totally leave alone the, the, the two weaker ones and only defoliate or cut back Correct. the two that are strong? Correct. And so a partial defoliation actually breaks it into three different strengths. And so the way they'll do it, in, like the way I do it in my garden, is strong buds or branches get defoliated, and if they're super strong, cut back. Um, medium branches have a few leaves taken off of them, maybe leaving four to six at the end, and then weak growth is 100% untouched. And so I go through that, and, and if you do that enough times, you'll get what's you'll get balance in the tree. And so balance in the tree allows us to do a lot of things. Balance in the tree allows us to then do what we want to do: prune indiscriminately, because now everything is equally balanced. And so now, if I prune everything the same, it's no big deal but it was a big deal while I'm trying to build the tree. Does that make sense? So we have to um, build towards balance. So these guys again, just finding where they straighten out and leaving like a two inch little section, an inch and a half, two inch section. And I'll probably clean up more of this too once I can see in here. Will you see yeah, anything over a quarter inch or bigger, I'll seal if I'm not putting a graft into it. I am. I am going to graft it. The other thing I want to talk about is building with multiple trunks. So you see, we're going to be building a multi-trunk. So who in here, who in here feels comfortable building designs with multiple trunks. I know you do. You have good trees, yeah. Um, so a lot of people are not comfortable building with multiple trunks. And the reason being is it's very confusing or it can be very, very confusing. There's a lot here and it can be very daunting to find a starting point. One of the ways that I started building out or at least starting to get my head around it was I started applying the old John Naka theory, the rule of threes to each tree individually. And so the rule of threes basically states that on a bonsai tree, 
you would have a first third that's bare of branches, no branches, and then a middle third that goes left, right, left, back, right, left, back, nothing to the front in that section, and then you get to the top, and that's where it would be 360 and very, very dense. So another way of thinking about that is no branches, framing branches with nothing to the front. So we're showing off the trunk and we're framing it with branches, and then at the top it's going to be a dense hat where you cannot see through it. It's obscuring the trunk line to the viewer. And so that's the rule of threes, and you can build just about any style of tree using that kind of paradigm uh, as branch placement guide. And so when I look at this, I start thinking, okay, a third of the way up on each trunk, and I start looking to form those branches. And so that's the pattern I'm going for. Now, obviously, I'm probably not going to have a lot of what I need today. And so I'm cutting it back to what I know I do have and waiting for the next step to come. So you're when you're built, waiting. what's that? You're not waiting. You're not just going to go. No, I'm not. Somebody else will be. Yeah, it is a little large, but I, I, I try it. I, I carry on trees pretty often. A little root garden. <laughs> I, uh, I taught in India earlier in the year, and there was a gentleman who was going back to Malaysia, and he wanted to take back a baobab tree with him. And so one of the, the hosts basically pruned off all the, the roots and pruned off the top and just wrapped it in saran wrap. And he took it through the airport and he got through security and he messaged us and he said they thought it was a, a log, just a piece of wood. And so he got it through just like that. I'm not condoning it, but still fun. So this is, this is problematic in here. This is a real big uh, iffy spot that I don't love. Um, I'm going to cut it. It's pretty low to the ground, too. Yeah, it is. But even if, if we could just start to get some, some taper on it, some division on it further back, that would be helpful. We used to have a ton of we used to have a ton of those at Weigert's, and uh, Eric got sick of them and got rid of them all. They're easy to get sick of. Yeah, they're pretty easy to get sick of. They own this place. Yeah. That when they had the big pheasant under glass uh, party. The big what? Pheasant under glass party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Buried my concave. There it is. Okay. So how far are you from the Wigerts? About 20 minutes. Yeah, so I go there a lot. I'm actually going to go there on Sunday to teach a couple of private sessions. So I still I still go out there quite often, um, just not to teach for them. You know, they don't do that anymore. Okay, so let's start doing some graphs. Uh, one of the areas that I'm going to start doing graphs is here on the end of this trunk, and we're going to put two branches in and try and fan that out. Anytime that's uh, where, again, like above 65, where you have a couple of weeks, you only need about six weeks to do graphs um, to get them to take. And so, if
if you do it around, uh, if, as long as you have about six weeks of good temperatures, you can get away with it. So I've done them in the middle of February. You know, we've had a hot February and I've gotten away with doing grafts then on tropicals. Um, it's best to do it when the tree is actively growing strong. So what do you do to break down the grafts? I will make them. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm using what's called parafilm grafting tape right. and I'm sealing the uh, cutting inside the tape 100% like this. And so what that does is ensures that the tape, the cutting does not dry out. So now as sunlight hits it or whatnot, the, the moisture that's within the cutting will evaporate, but it will only go into the plastic and then it'll be reabsorbed into the cutting. And so it won't dry out this way. So I'm going to make two of those real quick. I'm going to make one more to start. Do you do it all the way to the end? I do. I want to make sure it's fully sealed. I want to make sure it's fully sealed. Can you do a bare one and pass it around? Yeah. Let me do a couple real quick. Yeah. And the reason why you're grounding is to save that process along and you can carry two more than one. Exactly. Yep. So it allows you to, to dictate where the branch placement happens. So if we were in like Taiwan or one of those high-end countries that are growing top, top end bonsai, uh, they would just cut the tree back to the stage that the tree is at. So if the pad is going one to two to three, they'll cut it back to that third and then they'll divide in the four or they'll graft in the fourth. You know, they'll graft in anywhere where they need uh, that they're missing for their recipe. You know, so if they're making a rule of threes and they don't have a left branch, they'll graft in a left branch. How, how thin are you rolling that? You get it I get it tight. Like, not like, like really? strangle, strangling tight, but I try to get the tape as thin as possible and then wrap it as tight as really, possible. Really translucent. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And then um, you're trying to keep your wraps at about 50% or about 70%? Usually, as long as it's staying, like you'll, you'll find that if you're too tight on your wraps, then you're wasting tape. You're just going around not making a, a far enough uh, advance. But if you use, uh, you'll find the right angle because different widths of the tape will require that you go steeper or longer. So. Um, I try to get as many as possible. Uh, at, you don't want to graft with coarse growth. So if there's only two, two buds on the thing, you can do it, it'll graft just fine, but then think you have to, the branch is gonna be a waste and you're gonna have to cut it back to the first bud. And so what you're essentially doing is grafting in a bud so and not a branch. Are you using one year wood or this um, year's growth? Or? I can use even the green stuff, the semi wood. Okay. That, so I've used even green stuff on, I've even used the green stuff to graft. I like probably the semi woody the best, like about, this is probably my favorite to graft that size. Oh, yeah, well, on a bogey, this would be like, you know, this could be way, way before one year. That might actually turn that, that color within a four months. <laughs> that's the problem with tropicals, yeah. How long, how long do you leave the, uh, the tape on? Good question. So um, I leave it on. Usually it, it depends on if the graft pushes strong or if it doesn't. If the graft lingers, then the tape will have to be pulled off by hand, probably, or cut off. Usually, though, if all goes according to plan, the branch pushes out, rockets out of the, the tape, pushes through the tape, and basically gets so thick before you cut it that it like shirks the tape off itself. And so you don't really have to do much. And so on the best case scenario, uh, that's usually what happens. And I will say with tropicals, you usually, um, even if your technique's not, not really perfect, you'll usually still have around an 80 to 90% success ratio. And so it's a really, really fun thing to try. And if you fail, it's no big deal. You just try again and again and again until it takes and you get the branch you need and then you move forward. So let's go ahead and open this guy up. So the graft I'm gonna be doing is known as a cleft graft. Say that again. Cleft graft. Cleft graft. Cleft graft. And it's a type of scion graft. So scion graft basically means that I'm using a twig that's separated from its rootstock to graft. So the other types of graft, like thread graft and approach graft, use roots that are on the, the um, root stock to uh, keep the cutting alive while it's grafted. Okay, so you see how deep in I go as well? I go pretty deep in, and I'm going right into the middle of that trunk. So are you a quarter of the way in or half the 
I'm about uh, I'm about half inch in. About a half inch in. <coughs> Oops, did I give you guys one to pass around yet? This one's just a little one, but it gives them the idea. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this to a wedge. Same on both sides? Same on both sides. How important is it to have a really sharp knife? It's, it's pretty important. Um, it's really important. Now, you don't have to get an expensive grafting knife right away. The way I kind of learned how to graft was with an, just an X-Acto knife. But the problem is, is that grafting knives are single edge, which means if I wanted to cut a steak and I just went like this, a garden steak, then I don't need to do anything about the angle except hit the same spot. And it will find the angle and it will cut a point on the end of a stick. If I do that with a typical knife that it has a double bevel, then it will go like this and it will form a circle eventually. And it will come out as a, like a circular wound and so you won't get the straight cut. So usually grafting knives are a little more precise. You know, they give you a little bit better um, precision. A lot of guys use uh, single edge razor blades. Yeah, that's the same idea. They're cheap. Can you do a side cross too? Not yeah, cross. yeah, um, with bogies, I, I can do those. So yeah, you can do those. Those are known as um, veneer grafts, and those are also very, very common and very, very popular in tropical grafting. So you're leaving about a half an inch uh, or three quarters of an inch of, of the Yeah, so you see how that sits in there just like that? And so, yeah, this will be taped up, though, because I'm going to go around this with tape as well and seal that last little bit. Okay. But even if you did leave that exposed, that's not the end of the world if there's a little so bit back there. It doesn't matter if you get moisture in it. Just, no, I mean, I, I haven't noticed that it does. But I do try to seal it. So once I come in, I'm gonna put one more graft in, and then I've gotta come in here and seal this tight with tape, and so the whole thing will be sealed up. But I've had them where I've left the back open, like not really paying attention, and haven't really noticed that it had any effect. You know, some guys use like Elmer's white glue. Oh, sure. Or cut paste or whatever, you know, jam it in there. But the thing with the tape is, when you think about what cut paste does, so cut paste, seals moisture in, that's what it's doing. And so the cut paste actually does the same thing. So I've put it on, I used to do, put a lot of cut paste. So I'd always like put cut paste under here and then tape over it. And then I found that it was redundant. I found that the tape of, uh, does the exact same thing. And so I quit doing that and I just use the tape now. And so where'd my other graph go? There it is, okay. Sorry, I'm putting my pocket. That's all right. Uh, you don't seal it to because you're, you have high humidity in Fort Myers versus some, like some cow which is more desiccated. That's the case. Well, we'll see. <laughs> no, I don't think that plays into it. Um, so, Mike, on your graph right there, are you doing one side long and one side short? No, you cut? no, you can do that. Some guys do that. Um, I actually just do it even even on each side. Okay, so you're still doing a wedge and cutting both sides. Yep, exactly. Okay. Well, on a cleft graph, that wouldn't really matter. Right. On veneer, it will. You want the long side, side on the one side. Yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously it's more human than where you're at. Yeah. It's what? So more human than yes. where you're at. So would you suggest we protect that bit? You could. And in, in re yeah, I mean, I don't know what is, is going to happen, honestly, in, in, South, in Southern California. I can't 100% tell you. Um, what I know is, is in Florida, this would go right out in full sun with the grafts and everything, and I would treat it like normal. And I would usually, in two weeks, you'll know if it worked or it didn't work. And then in two weeks, you'll kind of either pull them out and try again, or you'll wait, and you'll, if they're working, then you'll wait six weeks and then you can wire them. So if you were doing this for a client in Texas, <coughs> what kind of effort there you Tell them, put it in full sun, water do wet dry cycle so basically water fully let it dry out at, until you water again until the grafts start pushing out and I would usually fertilize with a time release fertilizer that's pretty strong something that like we use 18 18 14 10 I think in the nursery so it's like really really high nitrogen stuff yeah we have a dry 
you do have a dry heat. And I don't know what that, you know, I don't foresee that it will be an issue. Professional grafters in Southern California tend to have a cherry tree greenhouse that they did on the grafting edge. So that, that might, be, might be something that uh, you guys need to do. I mean, I will say I do do this outside of the humid season in Florida where we don't have a lot of humidity. What's that? What season is that? that? I would say the, uh, the week of December January, yeah, to February, <laughs> March. Really? Yeah, it's pretty nice. Though. So in this grafting that you're doing right now, are you grafting bar branches? No. no. So what is a bar branch? <laughs> well, two, two coming up. <laughs> so is this, would this be a bar branch? Why not? Yeah. Nope, that's that's the exact same same spot. Oh, I can't see. Them. But right there. Oh, the one's going up? No, these two right here. Yeah. So that would not be a bar branch because because if you think of what a bar branch is, is we call it a bar branch here. If this forms like this. And this is why there's kind of a, a misnomer to this. This is a bar branch here. Now, what is the difference between this and a V? The middle. Right, the middle's here. And so that's a bar branch. Because what will happen now is it's not thickening 50% here, 50% here. It has a third entity thickening in the center, and they're all meeting at one point. And so you're going to get an uneven thickening in that area. Uneven thickening. So you'll usually get a, uh, a buildup of branches like that. You see how that's fat, like a big ball? And so that's reverse taper. That's what happens when you don't clean out and thin to twos. And so the other way, the old way that they used to tell you to, to wire branches out was wire out a terminal and then wire everything on the outside of curves. That's no different. That's still two branches meeting at one point. So whether this curves like this and has this branch coming out on the other side like that, that's the same, same stuff. It's the same thing. So it really doesn't matter. So the point, going back to what I'm saying, is these will be wired and flared out once they're kind of set, and they'll be positioned into the first four. I'm okay. okay. We're gonna take a break now. Okay. And uh, anybody want to come up and see what he's doing? There's refreshments over here. See Millie and her assistant Greg back there for raffle tickets. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they're on the very edge. Yeah. All right, Flurry versus the bud. Yeah, I don't know why this is working like that. 
Oh, I've got the second piece of tape. That's fine. What, what would that be? Why the more the better? Um, you have, it, that way, if any of them fail, you have backups, things like that. You know. always cut them off. Yeah, the more so the better. You, what do you is your success rate? On? Usually, honestly, no lie, it's probably about... 75, 80%? 80%, 90%, yeah. And on, on certain species, it's 100%. Like gardenias, it's almost 100%. Right. The cambium grows exactly. like a real... Exactly, real chunky cambium. They, they really do well with it. Will you see where it was grafted? Yes and no. So you will... If you're trained, if like once you know what to look for, you'll see it, yeah, on trees. But after a few years, you really can't tell. Like, even on trees I've grafted, I can't tell on, on whether it's a graft I'm looking at or whether the tree pushed it that way. Or so it becomes so like similar to what the tree does naturally that you, it's hard to tell. You see, you see how this looks right here, right? That's how that could look like a graft. It's no. not, no, but it could, grafts can look like That's that. That's just how it grows, this grows, and it, that graft will look like that. Okay. It gets a kind of, it swells right where the, where it grows in. How can people graft rootstock? Because they do a terrible graft, and so what happens, <laughs> yeah, they do it, they do a really bad graft, and so what'll happen is if I take this fat twig, right, and let's see, or this fat twig, this is a good one. Let me do this thing on. Let me just get this started. There we go. Okay. So I got that guy pretty ready. Let's cut this guy. Now you're going to see what will happen if I stick a big fat graft in here and I try to save time. So watch what happens to that juncture. You see how it goes, and it goes really, really fat as well. You see how fat that, even if I could tape that and get that to seal like that, it's still very, very fat here, and it will always be fat. And so even as this thickens, it'll just thicken that union, and you'll always see that bulge. So it'll always go skinny, fat, skinny. And so to avoid that, you go with a much thinner graft. So if I take something thin, and I put it in the end, like you saw, I put little thin grafts into the end of that. Well, now this shouldn't hold it out very much. I'm just doing a fast one. See, like, look at that. Why can't you cut half and stick the other half against it? What do you mean? So, like, if you get two pieces like that, and, like, half put diagonal. Like, Instead of stuck in the middle. Oh, what do you? Oh, you know you can't. What do you mean? You can't like this. And the other part like that. Oh, um, I think that is a type of graft. Uh, I don't know how to do that type though. Yeah, and that's not one I think that they do too often in bonsai. But that's like I would assume one of the reasons they don't do that is you would have to align everything really, really perfect. But I, that could be a graft. I know more often than not I see the wedge you know, lock and key kind of thing. I also heard from someone, you don't want to see the root, the graft of the root stock, to so graft it down in the root, so as low as possible. Or, yes, or, um, yeah, yeah, that would be a good idea. Gra get it as low down in the ground as you can, like as close to the root stock as possible, because that's exactly right, otherwise so you'll... Guys, guys that have been doing it a long, long time, they clean everything away, Right at the trunk line. Very right at the base. Right. You can't even see it. What if it was a tree grows older, doesn't it get taller? Does, it get that, taller? does that bottom part grow up? No, no. no. So how long is it gonna take uh, these graphs? About six weeks six weeks to where they're usable. So you go from this size to this size. That'll take take probably a five years? No, not that long, honestly. Like, for them to, to get about half that size, if you ran them out and you didn't prune them at all, in this size container, you could probably finish that out by the end of the year. No kidding. Yeah. Tropicals are ridiculous. 
don't know that we grow. I don't know that they grow that fast. <laughs> they, uh, yeah. yeah. That can stall them out. That can so low humidity to them is sixty percent. Yeah, and that, that, <laughs> that may that may affect you. That's what, that's what most guys run their greenhouses at. <laughs> right. That's funny. Is there a cold? Is there a cold water? Thank you so Anything much. Else? No, that would be that, not just cold water would be perfect. Thank you. We seal everything, and then we, we then we we'll, uh, seal everything again with paraffin wax. Help yourself with some stuff, man. Slow down, there. That way, uh, you All do right. too much, and you get uh... All right, cool. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So it's called grafting. So what that allows me to do is, if I want to build the tree in a certain way, and the tree doesn't have a branch there, or I'm not happy with the branch, I can stick the branch in there and kind of have it come wherever I want. So, yeah, so it allows me, yeah, it allows me to kind of cheat in a lot of ways. So, I just want to tell you, uh, I saw one of these videos the other day, and this one was sitting on tomorrow, and I appreciate it, and I love it. You know, there's a lot of stuff in <laughs> Sometimes I go and you don't get anything out of it. Awesome. You know, so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Especially big cuts on the trunk. That helps out big time. Wait, 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 wait. What is the uh, Oh, I use um, like my, I use a, a cut paste. Just any cut paste. Yeah, any cut paste is fine. Yeah. 
Before your you start, tape? what's that? Is this your favorite tape? Yeah, it's a it's a parafilm tape called Agilis, Agilis, and it works really really well. Okay, Joe. Okay, just a little announcement. Uh, one of our members. Hey, let's go. Quiet, quiet. Thank you. One of our members, uh, Dustin Shang. Walter passed away, uh, for some of you that know him, and uh, so we, we sent uh, flowers to him, and she was real appreciative of our uh, flowers, and I just want to let everybody know. Okay, okay here we go, play, Mike, thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Yeah, Jim is having a Yeah, he just announced Yeah, Jim's having a sale. I got announced, I got flyers here for the sale. just kind of grafting away. What I'm looking to do is build out these areas so that we have left branch, right branch, back branch on each of the trunks, ideally. And, uh, and we can start shaping these out as trees. So my next one I'm gonna come to is this stub back here. And I'm gonna put a couple of grafts in that. Or actually just one graft. Two grafts. I have a question? Sure. Are you going to leave that one in that same angle, or when you repot it, is it going to be at a different angle? I'd probably bring it forward a little bit, maybe, just the hair, you know, so that this trunk isn't going so far away from us. Um, that is, that does bug me a little bit. Where would be your front one? Here. So right in here. Yep. Anybody have any questions about tropicals in general or about kind of what we're doing tonight? No? What's a good soil for these? Oh, okay, good question. So, um, a coarse mix. I, I like, honestly, I will grow mine in, in an Akadama blend, but I think more people will have success if you do something really, really coarse, like um, Eric uses expanded shale, pumice, and lava and so it's all coarse mixed media and um, they grow really really well in that so that's what i would recommend most people doing unless you're really really familiar with growing with akadama especially trees that don't like staying too wet hey just real quick um jim pelling's having a sale and there's little flyers up here with his information so if anybody's interested in buying some of jim's trees grab one of these and give him a call yeah, there's no mob scene or wait around and take the number only one or two at a time. See, it's a limited parking street, and uh, you got your own time slot. Uh, it's a narrow street. I've been there. It's yeah. Stuff, it's tough. Joe, Joe, Joe calls it the Banzai Forest. <laughs> um, and they're cheap, right, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> and they're real cheap. What kind of pot would you recommend for that? So trees trees will always go in a 
a combination of masculine and feminine um, traits. So unless you're in Portland. Unless you're in Portland, yeah, yeah. Then they will. Had a fit when we said something about a tree that was Well, they don't believe in feminine or masculine? No, they lost it. It was hilarious. It was all I could do to not really like, hang a lot. No, I, uh, I still, the way I was taught, okay, the way I was taught is that pots and trees have both masculine and feminine features. So if I were to um, ask you, this tree gets flowers, right? But does it have any masculine qualities to it? Maybe the craggy bark, something like that. You're getting into dangerous territory. Here. What's that? You're getting into dangerous territory. I, this so, is how does that tree identify? How does that tree identify? <laughs> <laughs> but to, to answer your question, most pots have a mixture of masculine and feminine features. So the most masculine pot you can come up with is a square or a, a rectangle with cut corners everything's cut into the clay there's no ornamentation and that's it that's as masculine as it gets as you start adding ornamentation like cloud feet if i put cloud feet on that pot regardless of if it's glazed or not i've just added a feminine feature to that pot it's now a little more feminine if i add a belly band to that it's also more feminine or a window or indented corners things like that start to add to the femininity of the container so I have glazed pots that are in the shape of what I just said, very masculine, a cut block of clay, but it's glazed in very feminine colors. So how do you, what do you use that on? Well, I used it on a bluebell, which is a tree that's got tons of thorns all over it. It's got rough, craggy bark, sometimes deadwood, but it also has a nice dainty purple flower. And so it's a mixture of the feminine and masculine qualities. And so that can take some time getting used to, but as you learn more and more about what, as corny as it sounds, how pots identify, you know, what features make them feminine and masculine, you start getting better at it. What shape would you put that? I would probably go rectangle or oval. Um, those are my, for kind of informal trunks like this, that would be my go-to. I'm not a big fan of, of round pots, me personally, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. I don't like round pots except on Bunjin or uh, deep semi cascades. So, like, I wouldn't put a tree like this in a round pot personally. Not that there's anything wrong. Unless you have trouble finding the front. Right. <laughs> Good questions, though. Yeah, so um, tropicals are often not taken as seriously as, uh, you know, more traditional bonsai, and there's several reasons for that. They're junk trees. They're, they're <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Damn. They don't like it to be cold. Yeah, but they... Your trees are like, I only want to grow once a year. <laughs> yeah, all year. <laughs> I want two flushes. No, um, I, tropicals do get a bad rap, and the, the honest, the, I guess the deepest reason why is that inherently a tropical's life will always be more vigorous and more active and faster growing than like a temperate tree or a conifer. And so in a hobby that's prized for age and longevity, if the tree's not gonna live to be hundreds of years old, the Japanese really, you know, they don't have as much respect for it as a tree that can achieve that age. So they look at tropicals as like a novelty. Oh yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but nowadays that's starting to change because now people are doing grafting, people are doing bud selection, proper pop, uh, partial defoliation, and a lot of advanced bonsai techniques that used to only be reserved for conifers. So now we get to, um, we get to do some pretty advanced stuff now. Uh, what are your thoughts on like jade trees, like cork jade? I'm, 
see, you know. Whatever. He's such a hater. No, I I used to really until very recently. I, I wasn't wasn't a big jade grower. I didn't grow a lot of them, and uh, I used to like them. Fell out of love with them. Kind of fallen a little back in love with them. So they're they're a tree I use a lot for beginner classes, and I think they're a great tree to learn on. And I think they they can be great bonsai. I've seen some really, really ramified ones, some really, really cool ones with healed trunk wounds and everything. And um, so I think they can be cool trees. The, the biggest issue is that they're common. You know, it's common. It's like a dime a dozen. A jade bonsai is a dime a dozen. And so other than that, they're great material. Like the bonsai supply, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, one nice and Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, that's, I think that's why I don't personally work with them. I don't work with Fukin teas or a lot of the stuff. And it's not because they're not good material or that. If I saw a really sweet Fukin tea, like if I saw a badass one, I wouldn't be like, I'm not getting that because it's Fukin tea. I get it because it's a cool tree. Um, but I don't typically go after them because they're common, you know. And garbage. And garbage. What are your thoughts on the most tree or the silk tree? They can be pretty good. We be, we used to use the Southern Mimosa a lot and the uh, uh, False Tamarind a lot, which is very similar. Um, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of them. I think they're really really coarse, and so they can be kind of hard to get an advanced shape on, and that can be frustrating. But um, but you can try it, and you can you can work with it to the best of your abilities, especially if the material is free and available. You know, that really helps out a lot. Okay. Ouch. Free is always good. Free is good. Free, not always. What is your favorite ficus? Ooh, good question. I like tiger bark ficus the best. See, there you go. Mike is saying, you've been here for all week. It hasn't mentioned tiger bark ficus. I guess I, you don't like them. I do like them. I no, love them. Oh, oh. No, I love tiger bark. That's my favorite ficus of all. Um, I like a lot of different ficus. I grow a lot of different ficus, but uh, microcarpa or tiger bark is the number one, I think. So I, uh, I've noticed on tiger bark that there are some varieties that have uh, more pronounced bark than others. There are. And so, so what I'll tell you is they're all microcarpa but the tiger bark is very specific. It's also known as Kinmen, and it's a Taiwanese cultivar, and that's the one that's kind of become very popular as tiger bark. Uh, they also call it Golden Gate. Some people call it Golden Gate ficus. Um, but it's, it should be, if it's the right cultivar, it should grow very, very dense with the normal tiger bark, but it should get really, really small leaves as you work it down. Like it, there's the other microcarpa varieties are difficult to reduce, Tiger bark is really, really easy and um, and a pleasure to work with. Do you get a lot of aerial leaves? You do. Yeah, we do. I don't think we can really harvest here. We get a lot of aerial roots. One of the things you can do to help assist with aerial roots is that most figs are, or most of the figs we use in the tropics are um, Eurostigma figs, meaning they're in the banyan family. And all banyans start their life as epiphytes. So when they're first uh, germinated in a tree or in the crevice in a sidewalk or whatnot, they don't have roots in contact with soil. They get moisture through the air, through aerial roots. And so if you let a ficus, one of these Eurostigma figs, get pot bound, then it will oftentimes revert back to epiphytic form and start pushing a ton of aerial roots. Yeah, tropical bonsai has a lot of uh, unique uh, styles as well. So there's like banyan style, there's uh, African flat top style, there's, uh, what's some of the other ones? Um, windswept and weeping, I know those are also used in conifer, but they seem to be used a lot more in the, the tropics these days. I see them much more often used in the tropics. Do you like doing root over rock? Yeah, root over rock is cool. I do I got, like. I got a big one. Uh, you know what? The real narrow leaves. Yeah, a ficus. Uh, yeah, it seems to be uh, much more resistant and 
Oh, really? I put it in a bigger pot, so I'm very happy now. That's cool. I've had this about five years. That's really cool. What can, do you know what kind of fig it is? Just a narrow leaf? Yeah, a narrow leaf thing. And, uh, it was about this here big when I got it. This oh, really? Big, this big and five, six branches coming out when I got it. And there was in a little tiny little pot. Left it there too long, but last year I put it in a pot with about two inches around and all size. Yeah. Pot. I was pretty happy. Now it's growing good for you? Yeah, that's doing really well. That's awesome. And, uh, Can I ask you about the fruit that you have considered cutting off more branches? Yes, I have considered it. And why you didn't? Um, I'm, I'm okay with the branches that I left. I, I don't mind them. Why, is there something that you don't like? That might be that might be good. We might want it to look like a bush. Can always cut things later too. Yeah. You're just building layers through all the branches. Yeah. I'm just trying. Honestly, what I'm trying to do is build out a branch position so all of these trunks have to have a left branch, a right branch, and a back branch. So they all got to have that. Um, each of these trunks also need to, uh, I need to start figuring out the apex, how that's going to round out, how that goes one to two to four. So the apex of a tree should be just like that little wire claw. I think I have the smaller one. Somewhere. I buried it, damn it. There's one inside the wire Oh, it's all good. So when I make the top of the tree, I don't make a, uh, a single apex anymore. So I used to make like this one little stick sticking up. That's no longer how I build trees. I don't build trees, I scrap that whole idea. So now I build this. This is what I'm looking to build. So I'm looking to go one to two, two to four, four to eight, until I d disappear into the ether. So that's one, one of the things, like if you look at the branches that I've left, they do adhere somewhat to the paradigm that we're trying to get. If there's any problem, it's maybe this branch right here. But that does divide out, and I, mu and I left it there because it's something that could potentially be used. So as I work through the tree and I continue to look at it, I may take some of that away, but right now I don't really see any reason to remove more. I know we talked about bottle brush a little yeah. bit earlier, but I was wondering, do you consider that a tropical? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it grows in like Australia and stuff like that, so uh -huh. it's probably not like a, it's not like a rainforest tropical, but it's definitely a warm, uh, tropical climate loving tree, yeah. you know? And, and so uh, would it be okay to repot it at this time? Yeah. It would be fine to repot it this time. I would do it sooner rather than later because I don't like doing tropicals in August. I think August, especially here, it's probably too close to when the day gets shorter. And so think, let's say you repot the tree and it struggles. Well, if you did that in August and it struggles, well, now you're into September. And if it's still struggling, well, now it's not gonna recover well and it's gonna sit basically like growing very weakly through winter. And so now you have a troubling winter, very high rip, high stress winter with a tree that it could have been easy, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, the, uh, that, the old, they used to call grafting multiple colors of the same tree, they used to call that a chimera. And so you'd graft on all these different trees onto one tree, like some people would graft different citrus all onto one tree. And, What's that? Fruit cocktail. Fruit cocktail tree, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. So my our our fall doesn't really begin until it actually don't get fall. It's like summer all the way up to like October. Okay. So Well then you guys are a lot like us and that means you can go later than than um, you know, you can push things a little bit later. 
you want to think like one of the things though that messes with it is it doesn't matter about the temperature necessarily it's also the, the shortening of the day so as you get into oh. September the shortening of the day will slow down growth like at least where we're at is as soon as we get to September I notice I'll probably see 50% maybe like 40% reduction in growth and then once we get our first cold snap, I see probably an 80% reduction in growth. Oh. Yeah, everything stops. So, um, but that first like change in light really does start to slow things down. It also starts to not use as much water. So they're not, it's not as hot. Um, so that can be problematic if you're trying to recover a tree and you don't have optimum conditions to do it. So I used to, do, like everybody says for buttonwoods, pot them in August, pot them in August. I don't like doing them in August anymore. I think it's too close to the window. So as early as we can. As early as early as like I would say from late May onward. Late May onward. I assume you guys are pretty warm by then, right? This year was on. This year was on. Basically, we were ninety degrees by May. We have a ninety degree day in May. One day. One day. Out of one. <laughs> That, that, a 90 degree, de, a 90 degree day over. would have been refreshing lately. <laughs> yeah, this week. <laughs> Typically, we're safe from June or from May through August or so, In, into the middle of August. Oh, really? Yeah. So you guys are similar to us. What's the What's going to be your aftercare? Full sun. Huh? It's going to be yeah, full sun. Yeah. Full sun, uh, yeah, but not too moist. So the bogies don't like to stay too wet. And so if it stays too wet, it will get unhappy, especially since it's not gonna be using a lot of moisture while the leaves are off of it. And so I, I would be just a little careful with moisture. So given the, that root ball, you're not gonna suggest to reduce that root ball? I would, honestly, I wouldn't uh, be opposed to whoever gets the tree repotting it aggressively because think the grafts will respond well if they have a lot of vigor in the tree. So I, I've done repots and grafts at the same time. And had it. Would you cut that root ball in half? Yes. Yeah, and that's where I would start. And then I would continue on until I got what I needed to get it into a good container. So I, I personally, with bogies, I don't baby them at all. I basically want to get rid of all the problem roots right away, all in one sitting, ideally at the point of collection. So if, if I collected it the day I collect it, get it clean, as clean as you can so that you don't have to come in a year later and make another cut on the root pad. Do you, would you suggest uh, washing off all the soil and starting with fresh soil? Yes, 100%. <laughs> not, um, not once you're in bonsai soil, you can kind of leave a core, but when you're in this, no core, complete bare root. And at this time of year, it's okay? Yes, 100, 100%. What kind of soil mixture again? Recommend. I recommend like I like Eric's soil mixture for most people which is like a, a lava expanded shale and pumice and that's a really good mix so no organics at all no I don't like organics would except for here? what's that would you wait in here no, no immediately no immediately. yeah immediately I'm you, you could if you're doing your workshop okay <laughs> that's if you win so like I said, I'm going to repot it tomorrow. No, no, no. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to make a show in out of that. You, <laughs> you cut it way back to the stump and you grafted around it to where you could get your healing from both sides. Like sure, the, I do that all the time. And, and that would work. Okay. Yeah, I do that constantly. That's a, a very valid uh, way of thinking about this, is that you should combine with clip and grow. I combine clip and grow with grafting. And with that arc, that recipe or architecture, and it makes a very potent combo to so make like, trees quickly. On the thick middle branch right there, your hands are on. Like, this one? The big one. This one. On the, the one in front of you. Yeah, that. Well, down lower at the trunk, would you put four grafts on the top to, to heal a, a bigger... Right here? No, the no big on the big middle piece. Oh, this guy. Down I low, see. But down low, way down low. Like, what are you showing? Oh, like oh I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. down in there. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, I would graft a branch on one side and a branch on the other. Just two? Just or two. Because how, how it works is, just two, is how it works is 
when I first make this chop, right, I'm gonna cut, we're, we talked about John Naka's rule of threes. So I'm gonna find whatever size tree I'm gonna want. I usually want shohin. So the little trees I wanna make, I find a third of what their final height's gonna be. Boop, and I chop right there. And so what happens is by chopping there, I wait until I get two buds and hopefully they occur at 10 and two. If they don't, if they occur odd, you know, one's a little lower and one's higher, then I clean the meat in between the two so that I have a clean juncture where they're kind of healing both sides of the wound. So that looks like that. But now this is where it gets more advanced. So we talked about healing the wound, 50% here and 50% here, right? But that's gonna give you this. That's gonna give you an even distribution of energy into force. Oh. If I wanted to make an informal upright and I wanted to have a leader, so a stronger leader here, then I need to basically prune this one first at 25% healed and let this heal 75%. And so what'll happen is this will end up being thicker than this guy and this will start to divide into your first branch. We wait until that wound's completely healed and then I cut here. And now that's gonna give me my next branch and my new leader, one and two. And so now I wait until that wound 75% healed here, 25% uh, here, and then I cut here and here. And I get this and this. So I have a new top going up the tree. And so you see clip and grow is this, this pattern of just constantly dividing to twos and you're always getting a new top and either a side branch or a back branch. And so you're building stage by stage by stage. And the reason I do that is <laughs> it's very, very difficult to go backwards and finish. So it's very, very difficult to finish a tree out and work it to you have all your branches and then realize that you don't have a back branch and say, well, now how do I get a back branch? And then you gotta go through all these hassles like grafting, thread grafting, things like that or you have to cut the tree back hard and cut off all the work you just put in. So the idea is don't pass those points until you have that stage of the tree done. Don't pass and jump ahead. Yeah. So I'm guessing you have multiple trees at home. Yeah. How do you keep track of what you're doing with each tree? I look at it and I look at, like, so I'm, I'm, I've trained my eye to basically see the, these pairs very, very clearly. And so I see instantly where things are deficient in their stages, or I see where they're kind of more complete. So if I come across and I see that this is still one branch here, and this is one branch here, like that, but this has divided well, let me put that here so you can see. So if I have these straight branches here, and I notice that this is dividing well, and these haven't divided, well, I know right away what the work is that I need to do. I know that this needs to be cut and this needs to be cut so that it'll start to divide. Like that. And so you have to first memorize what you're looking for. You have to have an, an idea of what you're going for. You can't do bonsai with a, well, I'm just hoping that it works out. It's never gonna. So you have to have some kind of artistic intent. And even if you don't adhere to these strict, like kind of classical Japanese rules, you should adhere to some form of discipline. Be, even if it's your, something you come up with, even if, like I was saying, I've, Bob's heard this three times, but um, even if it's, it's something like the Dave DeGroote tree where everything is a right angle, every branch that comes out is another right angle, and you repeat that motif over and over and over throughout the tree, you'll make a successful tree. So if you come up with your own motif, your own rhythm, your own program, that's fine, but you need to start building it out as like a repetitive pattern, repetitive pattern. So my repetitive pattern that I really like is the old Japanese way. You know, it's tried and true. I don't have to worry about kind of going into unknown territory and potentially having my work suffer for it. So I like building the old way, but there's a lot of ways to build. Um, most of them nowadays still revert back to twos. Another question? Sure. I, I like asking. it. If you're going to stump cut that to make it like a show in, do you cut them flat or do you 45 and angle? Flat. Flat always, cut. Always flat. Always flat. Because you don't know. If I cut this at a 45 degree angle, right, how do you know you're going to get a bud right there? Yeah. You, you could graft. You could. But then why not just graft here and here? Uh, table, just 
No, you get great taper because this will swallow that. A it's no different than how trees, if they get cut and they grow new, new branches, it's no different. And so this will basically swallow one side of the wound here and this will swallow the other. Very rarely, unless it's like an alternate grower, do I have to go in and slant cut the meat in between the two branches. If it's an opposite grower, I never touch that flush cut. I just let them eat it. And so I haven't had to mess with that. But if you're not gonna graft, then slant cutting is, it's risky because you don't know for a fact that you're gonna get a bud on the tip of that, that angle cut. So you always cut flush first, wait to see where the buds emerge and then angle cut to that bud. On the big trunk there, why'd you keep that piece in the back? This piece? Yeah. Um, because it is a, a large divide. And, and one of the things I try to do, it's almost like I'm trying to build a tree without making a big cut. Like even if it means that I might have to, to make some compromises in other areas, uh, that's my personal approach, <coughs> just because I do hate when these things start to rot out. Uh, it's not to say I won't <coughs> cut it off, but if I can make it look appealing without doing that, then uh, I'm gonna do my best to kind of avoid that section. The other reason is if I cut that off, I will literally only have this like elbow here and no branches coming off of that. What I can do though is <coughs> cut it to there. I actually do see somewhere I can cut it. Actually, it can be cut. Right at that base branch, right? Yes, yeah. right here. That actually can be cut. Yeah, yeah, I do what's called semi clip and grow. Like, okay. one of the reasons I, I'm not big into wire anymore, and why I, it's not that I'm not big into wire, it's that I don't see the point. Um, if I if I wire out a branch and I, I take a branch that's this long and I put wire in it and I put all this movement into it, I didn't just wire in taper. There's no taper in that branch. So it goes all the way, the same thickness, all the way through there. So you know you need taper on the twig. So how do you get taper? You cut. So why do you wire all that out here? You see what I'm saying? It's like this is really all that needs to be wired, is what's back there. If your goal is to go from point A to point B as fast as possible, if your goal is because I, I have a lot of people in Florida that tell me, I'm not gonna live long enough to see this come to fruition. And I say, and I say yes, you will, that's, that's baloney. And I go into this whole process where I talk to them about how fast this can move. But you have to put off having your cake. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have a bonsai and also move towards a finished kind of design at, at, at an acceptable rate. You're gonna go much, much slower if it's in a bonsai pot you're pruning it all the time, you're keeping it super, super slow growing, but you're gonna get nowhere as far as like an intentional design quickly. And so if you wanna get somewhere fast, first you need intent, and then you need a good strategy to cross all the problems off your list as fast as possible. And so then you'll move through. I can get trees now, show him trees, and this is like legitimate, not cutting any corners. I can get them through development into refinement in about a year and get them in through refinement and into a nice tree that I can display in about two years. And so that's a, now that's efficiency. That's a lot of efficiency. What do I do? I take a four inch cutting, I put it in a little four inch pot like that. And as soon as it grows so tall that it's falling over and this, I'll usually wire them and put movement into them. But as soon as it gets so tall that it's falling over, I put it in a one gallon pot. And then as soon as that gets so tall that that's almost falling over, I put it in a three gallon pot. And now this is occurring every two months or so. So it's going boom, boom, boom in six months, three, three up pottings, three up pottings. So then I might finally bump it up to a five gallon eventually. And by that point, now I have so much soil that this thing is growing runners like this on a weekly basis. And so now this is, this is not a big deal. Now building with the tree is very, very easy and I want to get as much work done as possible before I put it in that small pot and then all that growth goes and it goes away. And How so, thick of a base or trunk do you get in that? Um, depending on species, I'm usually getting 
trunks. If I wait the full year and I up pot them, I can get trunks on sea hibiscus like bigger than a silver dollar. You know, so big fat trunks with curling bases and stuff. So really good show in material. And then you put about a year into building branches. And I'm not saying that's all you should do. You should put more time in the trees. But I'm saying is if you wanted to say, ah, I don't want to put in more than two years, you can still make a killer tree with no corners really cut in that amount of time. And you know, you know, now you're done. You don't have to worry about going back and healing wounds or, oh, I never got that back branch or, uh, you know, this tree's, oh, I hope it buds. This year's gonna be the year it buds. It's not gonna happen. And so it's, it's just better to build intentionally, you know, with good intent. Okay, so let's finish this off. Good questions though. Do you fertilize? I do. Yeah, I fertilize. Uh, our tropicals are mostly fertilized with a super high nitrogen fertilizer called Harrell's. Um, it, you can purchase it from Weigert's if you call them, or you can just use Osmoco. Um, but the uh, what you need is a high nitrogen fertilizer, something very, very high in nitrogen. And you'll need that while you're building the tree. Once you're done building the tree, then you can use organics to help slow the tree down. But when you're first trying to build fast and strong, um, you should be using a, uh, a strong fertilizer. So we use, you know, it, we used to use 24, 24, 18, 10, I think. And so it used to be ridiculous. And then we backed off to 18. You don't, and you don't have to, but it, it does speed up development, and it speeds up like how fast the tree will grow. But just think of it like this: there's not a right or a wrong way to do this. There is, there is, however, a faster and a slower way to do this. Okay, if you're finishing up, we're gonna start a raffle. Okay. okay you got me oh, I gotcha. Okay. So uh, we're gonna have two steps: we're gonna have the trees and then a stand. Okay. So, so, so you need to reach in there and pick out my ticket and stick it under the tree. Yeah. <laughs> and don't, don't pick anything with a squiggle. Okay? Don't pick anything with a squiggle? Yeah. All right. <laughs> reach down in there and pick some suckers up.
It doesn't matter what I wear. I was still a little bit small for that. Yeah, a little bit small, but it'll fit in there. Look at the hole you can have, sir. It's a joke. Squiggly one, hey Squiggly, you won. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know, I have to see it. Bring it with you when you come be able to. Everyone says we can't, but I, I see them growing in Texas and stuff like that, like pretty far south. And when I looked it up, they're hardy to zone 9. Yeah, I think the temperature is fine. Yeah. But we have a lot of other stuff. And, I mean, I grow stuff that's hardy, you know, hardy to zone 6, and I grow it okay in the shade, like goji berries and stuff. So I, I've been... I, I am willing to give it a shot. I haven't tried it yet. Right. 